Hello, and thank you for joining me. I'm Elizabeth Burden, your host for AZ Illustrated Arts. Tonight, visit the Sonoran Glass School, where students learn the demanding process behind some of the world's most fragile art, find out how artists at Odyssey Storytelling have spent a decade helping to build community, one story at a time. Go for a walk among the compelling figures created by sculptor Michael Cajero, and look ahead to Voices Across Borders, a multilingual event at this weekend's Tucson Festival of Books. But first, today's top stories. Lambda Legal filed suit against Arizona today, challenging the state's ban on same-sex marriages. The National Gay Rights Organization claims the ban is a violation of the Equal Protection and Due Process Clauses in the U.S. Constitution. This is the second suit filed this year challenging Arizona's ban on same-sex marriages. The state's unemployment rate continues to drop. A report released today shows Arizona's unemployment rate went down a tenth of a percent in January to 7.5%. While the seasonally adjusted non-farm employment rate went down, the month-to-month -month numbers show the number of available jobs in Arizona also shrank by about 42,000 from December to January. State economist Aruna Murthy told Arizona Public Media, while that may seem contradictory, it means Arizona continues to see a drop in the labor force and that affects how the percentage works out. She also said the loss in jobs is typical this time of year due to the end of the holiday seasonal employment. Over the last 12 months, Arizona has gained more than 55,000 jobs in all sectors. Students at Pima Community College will see their tuition bills increase nearly 8% next year as the school looks for ways to fill revenue gaps caused by a drop in state funding. The school's governing board approved a $5 per credit hour increase with a 4 to 1 vote on Wednesday night. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Sonoran Glass School is a nonprofit organization that promotes glass as a visual arts medium. It provides classes and a supportive environment for glass artists, students, and enthusiasts to learn and share knowledge. Here's Luis Carrion with the story. We've worked together for probably uh, close to 10 years now, blowing glass, and um, we collaborate a lot and uh, work as a team and explore both of our own ideas with glass and we help one another kind of get to our goals and everything like that. And it's nice because we get to have uh, two different outlooks at the same process. You know, I can only come up with so many ideas on my own. To be able to collaborate with another talented artist makes it that much more fun and that many more possibilities. The glass, depending on the temperature, is going to be moving at a different rate. You have to slow, you have to speed, you have to really feel the fluidity that is going on in the end of your pipe. So your rotation is the only thing keeping that from going haywire at any time. I think that's a, it's kind of a quiet piece as well, being able to keep things moving. I mean, the natural flow of life, you know, the earth moves around, so do we. Glass blowing requires tons of coordination and timing. Um, it would be very difficult to do by yourself. Depending on the size of the pieces, we might need even more help. We might have three or four people uh, helping if we were doing large vessels or really complicated color techniques. And the whole time you're working on it, you're engaged. You can't take a break. There we go. We're going to grab the jacks again. So you're opening the lip a little wider as I'm keeping the lip flat on the top. And you can come off. You can set that tool down to be aware that those blades are smoking hot now. We're going to just touch the sides nice and easy, and I'm going to blow. Today we're going to have uh, quite a few middle school and high school kids in here. So that's always fun and challenging at the same time. Thank you. Trying to keep a uh, a bunch of children safe in such a wild environment with the fire and the glass and all the dangers. Oh, that's a nice view. But um, it seems to me that it keeps everybody's attention, which is
which is really good. That's good, you could come up. Go ahead and step in. And you're gonna grab the jacks. Lots of rotation. Keep turning, keep turning, keep turning. This is my first time making a cup, but in the hot shop, it's not my first time. I've made one paperweight and two um, ornaments, and that requires blowing. The paperweight does it. But the cup, it was a lot more difficult uh, than that. It's uh, a lot more heavier, and you have to do more. Yeah, we're gonna come up to the bench. He's a really good teacher. I like him. He's helpful and he sees like if I'm not doing something right, he'll help me and teach me how to do it. Yeah. Instead of just doing it for me, he'll teach me. Today we're here at Sonoran Glass. We come actually twice a week with the 7th and 8th graders and the 8th graders are making right now a glass mosaic of the school logo which will be incorporated into a larger design with our name and some metal work for a sign to go outside our school. When we start a new cycle with new students here, the glass school is always really good about kind of giving them a foundation of just the basics of what is glass, how is it made, where does it come from, so we kind of start with a science-based approach, get them a little knowledge about it, and then the, you know we kind of build on it. We're, they're doing everything as you've seen from mosaics to hot shop work to making beads in the flame shop. And it kind of gives them an interdisciplinary approach to creating stuff together as a team. You know, these guys are working together, making something. They came up with this plan together and they're seeing it through. And a lot of it is really just a way to do something really fun and whether they even realize it or not, build a skill set into them. You know, the, the collaboration that's happening right now they're just doing it naturally. We don't really have to do much about it because the fun of no the medium just kind of brings that out of them. You know, they want to do it. They get to play with all the stuff they're not supposed to at home. They get to play with uh, fire and glass and torches and all these things that are already intriguing to any young child. <laughs> and uh, that's what initially draws them in. So now we're going to do the final step, which is getting the... Color. And then the open-ended creativity is what keeps them there. Um, to be able to explore any idea that they think of, and there's no rules. And a lot of the children that come in here, um, the glass is one of the things that kind of opens them up initially, because they might be quiet or withdrawn from arts. Uh, and um, they might think that all oh, there is with art is painting and drawing, which is what they're exposed to at school. So um, here they get to see this whole new realm of creative process that they've never seen before. The idea of standing in front of an audience and spontaneously sharing a personal, real-life story may sound to some of you like a terrifying way to spend an evening. But my next guests are part of a group that's been inviting their friends and neighbors in Tucson to do just that for the last 10 years. Penelope Starr is the founding artist behind Odyssey Storytelling, and Shannon Snap is Odyssey's producer. Thank you both very much for joining me. Sure. Thanks, Thanks for having. inviting us. Penelope, how did Odyssey originate? Well, 11 years ago, I went to a performance of a storytelling event in San Francisco that my daughter-in-law started called Porchlight Storytelling. I just loved it so much. When I came back to Tucson, I decided that Tucson really would appreciate something like this, so I started one here. And what was it about the format that appealed to you? I think it was that it was a two-way street, that the storytellers and the audience both got benefits. The storyteller got to be heard by um, a group of people and very much appreciated. And the audience got to hear about a life or a lifestyle that they might not um, have exposure to in their everyday life. And what really clinched it for me was during the intermission when the audience members started talking to each other and sharing stories that were from their lives that were um, spurred on by what they had heard. Well, I'd like to know how the storytellers are chosen, but I'd also like to know if people often graduate from being audience members to being storytellers. Well, that's what we hope, <laughs> but it's not required. Um, a lot of times the storytellers um, contact us because they've heard about it, because we have a website and we put the themes on the website and the theme might appeal to someone and they might say, I have a great story for that. Um, sometimes we ask people that we know might have 
good stories in, if they're in a certain field and it might work out. Um, sometimes we push our friends into it. Well, I wonder about the themes also. How are they chosen? Um, what's the idea behind uh, gathering stories that revolve around a certain theme? Well, the, the idea is to make themes that are extremely um, broad so they can be, be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And that's what makes a really good and interesting night of storytelling. Uh, so we have a crew, a volunteer crew, that we all get together at the end of the year and pick the themes for the following year. And we come with our ideas and we fight them out and the best ones end up on the, on the schedule. Well, Shannon, as producer of Odyssey Storytelling Events, tell me some other advice that you might want to give prospective storytellers on their first night. What do you, how do you prepare them? Sure, so I'm one of, I think there are three other producers right now. Um, and we usually tell storytellers that you're going to be nervous, that's very normal, but to try to channel that nervousness into excitement and to think about the body having similar physiological reactions to excitement as it would nervousness. So just think of it as you're excited instead of being nervous. Um, we also tell people not to memorize their story because if you're telling a true story about your life without notes, that story is going to change each time it's told. So I might tell it to my friend, I might tell it to a family member, and each time it comes out, it's going to be a little bit different. And to just expect that that's going to happen on stage too. So the story you tell at rehearsal may be slightly different and likely will be the night of the show. And that's perfectly normal and okay and natural. Um, we also tell storytellers to invite their friends and their family. This is one way that we build audience members. A lot of times, as Penelope said, we get folks um, from the community that we might not reach in our normal audience base. And so we say, bring them in, bring your family members, bring your um, collection of people with you. And usually that is when we then start to attract a newer audience and also potentially get those folks to tell stories later on. How did this become a part of your life? Um, I moved to Tucson in 2011, and uh, I had been a co-founder of a storytelling event in Boston with my partner, Roscoe Mutz, who is also a producer. And we came to Tucson thinking, maybe we'll start a storytelling event in Tucson. And then within a week, we found out about Odyssey Storytelling, and I think the show is the following week. And so we just showed up, and there was Penelope at the door greeting us, and we said, oh, this is so great, it's happening, and we want to be involved. And she's like, this is great because I'm retiring So as the founder and we need more help. And so we just immediately um, were inserted into the, the program. Well, Penelope, how are those retirement plans coming along? <laughs> I really am retired, but I'm a volunteer now. So I'm not the one that's responsible. Adam Hostetter is the executive producer, and I show up and help out. So I am retired. Well, I'd like to hear from both of you about your earliest storytelling uh, memories when you first tried it. What did it mean to you? I think for me, you know, everyone has a story. If, if you talk to any person, every person that you meet has some story about so many different things. And to give people this space um, and this venue to tell that story can be deeply powerful. So personally for myself, um, when I've told a story, it's usually pretty intimate to do so, and yet it's an audience of roughly 100 people each time. But thankfully, we have this really great, loving, supportive audience, and they're really um, compassionate and kind and help the storyteller feel welcome and safe. And so I think it, it tends to be an experience that's really positive. I've never had seen a storyteller walk away and think, oh, I wish I didn't do that. Instead, most people are really feeling affirmed and feel like they were heard, and I think there's a craving for that in our society, just to have your story be told and for others to see you and to know you a little deeper. Well, what about your memory of first standing on a stage in front of other people and sharing your story? Um, my first memory is I wanted to get off stage as quickly as I possibly could. <laughs> but um, I, I've, I've always seen this uh, event as a way for me to facilitate other stories, not as a place that I tell my own story. But if people have been coming to the shows for the last 10 years, and I was the host pretty much alone for the first seven or so, they will have heard little snippets from my life and they could write my autobiography from that. Well, here we are at your 10th anniversary. You just marked it with a, an event, but you continue to have them monthly. What do you think this means, this milestone for you? I think it's the beginning of the next 10 years of storytelling in Tucson. And what are your hopes for the future of Odyssey? 
I think I would really like to see our audience base grow. Right now we're in um, Flux Studios, which is a space that holds roughly 100. We have a couple of shows that have sold out this year, which has been really exciting for us, though we hate to turn people away. Um, so I would just like to see it grow and get bigger. And also, we've had some younger storytellers emerge. We've had a few youth on the stage, and I would like to see more of that, as well as branching out to different segments of the community we may not um, normally encounter. And so I'd like to just see the, 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 the community itself get more diverse. Well, thank you very much for sharing your plans, and uh, we have some samples of Odyssey storytelling on our website at news.azpm.org, where you can go and see Odyssey in action. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Judy Woodruff. On the next news hour, Miles O'Brien reports on the future of nuclear power in Japan, three years after a massive meltdown. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. For years, the U.S. shipbuilding business was in decline. Then came the oil boom. All this oil is coming down to the Gulf Coast, and we're going to need to move that oil around the United States to refiners. And that was a market no one really saw two or three years ago. I'm Renee Montaigne. Building ships to carry oil by sea, an old industry gets a new life on the next Morning Edition from NPR News. Michael Cajero is a prolific Tucson artist whose medium is paper mache. He wraps wire skeletons with discarded paper products to create what he calls representations of the human condition. A large collection of Cajero's work is now permanently installed at the Process Museum, and that's where Luis Carrion went to find out about this artist's unique vision. Ah, oh, yeah. Where are these instruments, these gloves? Just not very good. These are I had not been doing any paper mache for maybe almost a year because I got so depressed because I, I couldn't make any more. I didn't have any more room in my studio to make any more work. And in a way that was good because it gave my, my hands and time to rest because I was having problems with arthritis in my fingers. I'd been working with pressing and, and manipulating the material for such a long time, my, my fingers wouldn't work really well. You know, Picasso said that if you want to make a dove, the first thing you do is wring its neck. You know. My name is Michael Cajero. I was born in Tucson in 1947 at St. Mary's Hospital. And I uh, learned how to draw looking at comic books and working from an instructor on TV, uh, Chuck Wagon. It was in the old days. my collection here of all the work to this building, I, uh, I loaded up, I did all the curating, I did all the installations, and, I, and, I, and I, it was the first time in my life I'd been able to work with space the way I wanted to work with space. I draw in space, that's what I do. Each room has a different installation. They deal with different ideas, uh, different themes. And then I have some obscure rooms where the meaning is uh, intentionally obscure so that people can bring their own uh, uh, their own meaning to the to the room. What comes first is the image and the form. I don't start with words or with uh, an idea particularly. I get an image. That's somewhat different from a lot of art that's done nowadays because a lot of art is, comes out of concept and then the form comes second. But in my uh, work, I work with the form first and I keep it paramount. I'm always paying attention to the form and how it looks and 
so forth. You know, pretty simple. You know, it's very understandable and readable. Black is a, is a prominent um, color in the works, and they became dark and blackish. And I like the black because they stand out against uh, the, the background. The key is to get a simple image, a quick image that reads really quickly. And the black does that. It simplifies the image so you get an instant, instant readout of what you're, an instant gestalt of what you're, you know, what you're looking at. So uh, I've prepared the solution here. This I have to do because uh, the surface is too, you know, it's just too rocky and... It's not like drawing. And I've always felt like I wanted to do that. I'm not satisfied with, with flat space. I want, I want real space. I want to get a movement along this way, so I lay the strips through here. Now this, I want to add strength in this. When things happen in the world, I, I respond with, uh, maybe not directly, but after a time of, of gestation, I, I start to get an idea. And uh, like the black sites, all the various wars during, uh, starting in 2003 in Iraq and Afghanistan and and I've lived through the Vietnam period, you know. I mean, it goes way back. It just seems like it's been, the country's been involved in a series of wars for a long, long time. My interest is to shed pathos and feeling um, through the work about the human condition and about living in this world, you know, that's, that's what I, what I want to do, you know, and capture something of what it means to live through this period. The sixth annual Tucson Festival of Books is this weekend. As part of it, the University of Arizona Confluence Center is hosting a multilingual event called Voices Across Borders. The goal is to create a cross-cultural dialogue about the connections and disparities that describe life across borders. Here is Mark McLemore and his guests to tell us more. Joining me now to talk about the Confluence Center's presence at this year's Festival of Books, we have the Executive Director of the organization, Javier Duran. Thanks for joining us, Javier. Thank you and Heather Gray. Now Heather used to be an intern and employee here at Arizona Public Media. She is now, what is your title at the Confluence Center? I am the Community Engagement Coordinator at the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry. In relation to this presence at the Festival of Books, how does your job come into play? What does it mean? Well, we are participating for the first time in the Tucson Festival of Books with a new venue. Um, and so as I came to the Confluence Center, um, you know, part of my interest as an artist myself and as an arts organizer is getting arts out into the wider community. And I love the literacy mission that the Tucson Festival of Books supports and that it's completely free and open to the public. So I've been working with the Tucson Festival of Books Committee, who's been doing an amazing job putting this whole event together, um, as well as uh, a number of members of our own committee including the Mexican Consulate here in Tucson and the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to bring all the details together and, and make this accessible to everyone. Well, rather than just hosting a tent or a guest speaker, you have chosen a much more challenging presentation. Uh, tell us about the first of these three major components, which revolves around the literary side. Yeah, we decided to invite uh, four women writers, uh, two from Mexico City and two from the United States. And we uh, are really looking forward to the sharing of experiences from these four different uh, writers, a poet, a narrator, a professor of history who also is a writer, and also an established Chicana author from Texas, Norma Cantu. And so we believe that this convergence, this confluence of voices will really, really enlighten and educate our, our local audience about what is it to live across borders, what is it to live in a society in which we talk about borders and yet sometimes the voices are not heard. So this is one of our main objectives in terms of this panel. And uh, what about c carrying on a political discussion? The Voices Across Borders theme is uh, enacted in what way? 
Well, we have a, a panel uh, about conflict on the border, and we have a journalist, an academic, and a person that has written about security issues come together and discuss what that means in terms of not only the conflict, but possible solutions, and what kind of dialogue this can take place. How can we embrace a dialogue that brings solutions to some of these issues? Another aspect is a memorial for an educator here in Tucson who made a mark on many professionals today. Yes, the Don Miguel Mendez, who used to teach uh, in this very same building for many years and who became uh, an example in terms of being a, a construction worker that became a university professor. It's an amazing story. And uh, uh, someone that educated many people here in the Tucson community who is highly admired, we felt that we needed to pay uh, due respect to his memory and bring the community to join uh, in this effort. Um, the event is also described as being a multilingual uh, affair, so can you explain that aspect of it? Who would like to take that question? <clears throat> I take that. Um, one of the uh, panels is about poetry in three languages, so we're fortunate to have Ofelia Cepeda, our colleague here at the University of Arizona, Briseida cuevas Cobb, who is a Maya poet from Mexico who's coming, and our poet laureate of the state of Arizona, Alberto Rios, joining in this uh, panel, and they will read the poetry in three or four languages, in fact, uh, Maya, Tohono Doham, Spanish, and English. So I think it's a wonderful opportunity to appreciate how our community is also not only multi-ethnic, but multi-lingual uh, as well. Well, Heather, in your role as Community Engagement Coordinator, what are your goals for this event? Uh, well, we do have a really large venue, and we're hoping to um, have a lot of people come and show up and um, we're going to be at the Stevie Eller Dance Theater so we have panels um, all day on Saturday and on Sunday as well. Um, we have lots of seats, we have lots of interesting panelists, we have lots of um, people from the community and besides our four invited uh, authors we have, as Javier mentioned, um, Ophelia Zepeda, Sylvia Longmire, um, Adalberto Guerrero, so people from all different um, parts, scholars, academics, analysts, poets um, that will be present. So we're just, um, you know, concentrating our outreach efforts on, on getting people to come. Well, Javier, how does this fit in with the Confluence Center's larger mission? It is an important component of our community engagement aspect and also not only, some, not only to bring the research and the work of our colleagues to the community, but bring to the community to campus. We believe that the festival is doing an amazing job in empowering our young people through reading and literacy, and we believe that's an important component of our land-grant mission as the University of Arizona is. And so this venue provides that opportunity for the community to come to campus to see culture, to see uh, um, literature, and also to see themselves represented in some of these amazing uh, writers that we're going to have here this weekend. Well, thank you for joining us here on AZ Illustrated Arts. Javier, you and I also had a discussion for radio, uh, and I talked to Norma Cantu, one of your visiting guest artists. Excellent. And uh, those interviews will be featured on Arizona Spotlight. That's uh, Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. and Saturday at 5 p.m. on NPR 89.1. You can visit us online at news.azpm.org to post a comment on any of our stories or to keep up with the latest news. I'm Elizabeth Burden. Thank you for watching AZ Illustrated Arts.